90 airline tickets available at half price for the Hunters game. Oil Search Orchids don jerseys for the match against Jillaroos. And the PNG flag flies high at the Asian Games. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for today's news. NCD Governor Paul Spakop has joined in the Hunters' Fever. He announced a 75,000 kina subsidy to help supporters make it to Suncorp Stadium in Brisbane for the grand final against the Sunshine Falcons. The payment to Air New Guinea will ensure fans pay for a return airline ticket at half price. It's good news for SB Hunters fans who wish to make it to Brisbane for the Interest Super Cup Grand Final on Sunday. A partnership between NCD Governor and Air New Guinea will enable city residents to take a seat on a special flight leaving Port Mosby on Sunday at 7 a.m. The plane should arrive back in Port Mosby around midnight. Uh, Hunters being you know, uh, our franchise here in the city, although uh, representing the country, we uh, going to support them in the way that we can. And today, I'd like to announce that we are contributing 75,000. It will be a subsidy to a special flight that the New Guinea will be organizing uh, just for Sunday. To get to Brisbane, everybody go to Suncorp and uh, cheer for the Hunters, bring them home, win the grand final, get back to the airport and get back to Port Mosby. Hunters supporters with valid passport and visa will pay for a return airline ticket at half price. And New Guinea, a sponsor of the Hunters and Governor Pakop, know how patriotic Papua New Guineans have been all throughout the season when they packed the National Football Stadium to watch the home games. Therefore, this special flight has been arranged to give supporters a chance to make it to the grand final as well. As you can appreciate, we also have a schedule to run. We have an obligation to our people in Papua New Guinea and our overseas uh, travellers to maintain our schedule. But thank you to the good governor who's been able to come on board. We'll take 90 Papua New Guineans down and the aircraft will remain in Brisbane. Thank you, governor, for your contribution towards that. And those people can then join the rest of the Hunter supporters at Suncorp and we will have them leaving Brisbane at uh, quarter past 10 in the evening, arriving here just after midnight. But of course, after you won the cup, the interest cup, who cares what time we arrive back into the country? <laughs> <laughs> because we will still be celebrating once yeah. we arrive here. Yeah. But there are two other important criteria. First, you must be a hardcore, proud Papua New Guinean. And mm -hmm. secondly, you must be able to shout and scream mm -hmm. and, you know, do your part uh, to um, bring the hunters home. Only city residents with valid passport and Australian visa can contact the Air New Guinea sales office for Sunday's special flight. So uh, we are excited. I think uh, the whole of PNG is behind the hunters. We are making history and let's be part of this history. Let's uh, bring the hunters home, win the grand final. And I think it's all good for the future. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Lay fashion entrepreneur Sarah Howder Todd has thanked all those who supported the exposure of PNG designed fashion in the UK last week. Sarah Howder Todd was one of several designers from the Pacific that displayed their work at the London Pacific Fashion Collective. The work included collections from various designers in Papua New Guinea as well as her own. These are some of the pieces that went on display in front of an international audience. Designed by Papua New Guineans, it's the first time many have been shown in a city like London. Fashion entrepreneur and lay resident Sarah Howder Todd, who sent a short video by phone from London, said the exposure means a lot for PNG fashion designers. Papua New Guinea is a living, moving, great, great, great big canvas of art. And we have a thousand cultures and 800 different languages. And to me, they were talking points, they were conversational pieces that uh, we brought to the runway. All the pieces are inspired by Papua New Guinean cultures. Designers from Double A Tribal, Baiwa, Tabu, and Haninamo drew from their roots to create stunning international standard pieces. A few of her own have come from this tiny shop in the center of Lay City. A bit of Morobe and Lay City on the world stage also got airtime on the oldest television network, the BBC. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. 
Port Moresby Nature Park, in partnership with the NCDC, is set to host Pasasin Tumbuna Festival this Sunday, the 24th of September. The festival is focused on showcasing traditional skills and knowledge involved with traditional craft, including carvings, basket weaving, as well as preparation and making of traditional food. Nature Park General Manager Michelle McGeorge says the day is a cultural celebration of skills and traditions that are at risk of being lost with the pressures of modernization. Also to be held at the Nature Park on Sunday is the 2017 Lukim PNG Now Tourism Expo, which will see over 34 tourism-based organizations showcasing their products and services. A group of young people from West Taraka in Leh organized a musical talent show to end the 42nd independence celebration on Sunday. The community believes they can help bring changes for the betterment of the community. The youths performed live bands to perform and raise funds to help develop the community. The event was organized with the support of Zilu Scientific and PNG Panamax. Children and adults celebrated with different performances of music, dance and songs. West Taraka is a suburb in Ley, known of the criminal activities taking place there. The celebration organized was set for the first time in the area. This plan is addressing lawlessness in the community. This plan is addressing political difference. Also present was Morbe Governor, who was happy to see such programs organized in the community. The governor said in order for developments to take place, everyone should change attitudes and be responsible for their community. He said this after the police station commander requested for the reconstruction of a new police station that was burned down by the youths from the area last year. My duty to go there and find out what's happening, but I must not pay attention to what they say, but I must listen and I know what's happening there so that to give them money to build their police station is not the right time to talk about it now, but make them change first. And if they behave, then I said, okay, when I tell you this and that, and after that, you have been behaving properly. So this is the token of appreciation. There are currently 27 bands in West Taraka, including 11 gospel bands. These young people believe that with musical talents, they can work together with the police for the betterment of the community. Six artists living in the area are supporting these young people to use music to help change the community of West Taraka. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Thor Jensen, a Danish adventurer and illustrator who embarked on a voyage to circumnavigate the whole island of New Guinea on a traditional canoe, is on the verge of completing his journey after arriving in Port Moresby today. After one year and 20 days, Jensen, accompanied by local sailors Justin and Senakoli from Milne Bay, will soon cement their place in the history books of sailing in Papua New Guinea. The voyage began in Tawali Resort in Milan Bay Province on August 30, 2016, where the 36-year-old from Denmark, Todd Jansen, accompanied by two of Milan Bay's finest sailors in Justin and Sanakoli, John. Milan Bay people, it's common to travel in your own area, but travel outside and travel outside their country is amazing, yeah? And they've been uh, such great uh, representatives of, of Papua New Guinea. After dangerous high seas and treacherous currents, with little or no food supply, the trail has circumnavigated the second largest island in the world. Home to Papua New Guinea to the west and the Indonesian province of West Papua to the east. I think, uh, I think people thought it was too risky and people thought it couldn't be done because it's a, it's a world record, it's never been done before. But it was not all smooth sailing. Jensen and his crew were stranded in Vanimo for two months due to lack of funds. Wait two months in Vanimo to get the right papers for, um, for entering uh, the country. Jensen claims he would be the first person in the world to attempt this journey without using a modern vessel. The trio arrived at the Royal Papua Yacht Club today to a small welcome ceremony. Uh, uh, Sandy Robson uh, last year, uh, who was the female that went around Papua New Guinea in a, uh, in a canoe kayak. We invited 3K obviously to welcome Thor today um, in, a, uh, um, uh, in his canoe and kayak with his team. 
um, traveling from, uh, I think they came from Fishman's Island this morning. So yeah, it's great to have him here. After traveling 5,600 kilometers around the entire island, with changing geography, which requires versatile sailing skills, the journey is almost complete. <laughs> and uh, we're really struggling for food and the weather was bad, but but still we made it so far, yeah. They will be in Port Mosby for about a week before sailing back to Tuwali Resort in Milan Bay Province to fully complete the entire course. Shane Saroya, National MTV News. Here with National MTV News, we'll have the day's other top stories after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Upon launching the country's first desalination water supply in Manus, a local water engineer believes desalination water can be effective in providing safe water for maritime communities throughout the country. Tom Pajan, chief engineer of the BP Island Desalination Water Supply, says the water technology is easy to use and can be maintained if looked after properly. Pajan said it is also effective during times of drought where seawater can be converted into pure water. This piece of Japanese-made technology converts sea water into safe drinking water. As Chief Engineer Tom Pajan of BP Island explains... Where the whole system long going to go down long well. Uh, from there, and by coming along this little machine, this little machine now is treating water. The machine filters sea water into fresh water in a process known as reverse osmosis which simply means removing harmful bacteria to create pure water that is fit for human consumption. A very simple machine, you know, complicated to us. Uh, this how system the machine is working, it's just simple. From the well, it comes along, treatment one end, and it goes to the tank, finish, make a drink. Pajan believes this simple technology is enough to cater for a small community. On their island, it provides up to 3,000 liters of water per day. Maintenance on the other hand can be a problem, but he says if properly managed, the only thing that needs maintaining are the solar batteries, which power the water supply. If it's three years, them low batteries, after that term, we need to change the or something. But otherwise, longer uh, operation or something, and passing locate, so how we play, look out to something. The desalination water supply is the first of its kind to be established on an island community. And if successful, it will be rolled out to every maritime community in the country. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. A village in the Hoskins local level government in West New Britain has established a housing scheme. Despite not receiving any support from government agencies, elders of Vovosi Village believe the scheme will help current living conditions and improve better housing for the community. Ten families have benefited from the project. It's a first-of-its-kind community initiative driven by elders of Vovosi village in the Oskins area of Talasia district. They say roads, electricity and other vital services can come later, but their priority is better housing for every family in the community. Now we place that in now project blowing plan now. M housing scheme blow bless yet. Um, this is project now, I'm play it, I'm play I'm play online no play. This week would be the third week for the community project. Four to five logs are ripped with nearly 100 to 250 timbers produced every day. Ten families have benefited and plans of helping neighboring villages are in place. The project has received no funding or help from any organization, but community leaders want an open dialogue with members of parliament to assist and improve the scale of operation. We ask him all he can, all he can come, now walk him assessment, now he can kiss him sampler. 
Sharing some idea what one day we blow, we can find him, we blow some money, low animal people, low place, low some low cream, or kappa, or something because we brought him. Or Lucas Mill, or transport law, we black and move him. Palang in San Lobus, Nakamosa, low place. With the limited resources, those involved are confident local resources will be put to good use for the benefit of the community. So, for me, I've got him all the way now, the poor house in two weeks. Now, for me, I've got to continue in a building more community. In a building more community, one time, slow housing people, skip project. The initiative is the first in the Oskins LLG. Jack Lopave Jr., National MTV News. Employees of ANZ PNG will look forward to better working conditions following the signing of an agreement with the PNG Banks and Financial Institution Workers Union. ANZ PNG CEO Mark Baker signed the agreement, the first since a similar agreement was signed in 2004. The agreement came into effect this month. As one of the big banks in the country, ANZ recently signed a new agreement to pave way for significantly better working conditions for its employees. According to ANZ PNG CEO Mark Baker, the benefits from this new agreement are significantly better than the previous one, which was signed in 2004. This new agreement also brings ANZ PNG on par with global ANZ group standards. Among the benefits, a 10% increase to salary budget payable over the next two years with an average salary increase of up to 6%. Significant increases for key allowances such as domestic travel, meals and shift work allowances. An increase of five days paid annual leave to non-managerial staff so all staff now receive 20 days paid annual leave irrespective of position. In addition, employees will also be entitled to three days paid paternity leave for male employees and three months paid maternity leave for all female employees. Eligible ANZ employees will now also have access to housing grants, something similar to what other financial institutions are providing for their workers. Negotiations for this new agreement had taken close to a year, with union representatives careful to ensure a successful outcome. According to Union General Secretary Vera Raga, ANZ has demonstrated leadership in this trying economic climate and the union is confident of continued sound industrial relations between the parties in the best interest of their constituents and key stakeholders. These improved benefits now are available to all ANZ employees across the country. One man is dead and another injured resulting from two vehicles colliding in Leh this morning. Police at the scene said the accident was allegedly caused by a drunk driver who was driving a Hino fuel truck. He was apprehended by police soon after the accident. The driver of the smaller vehicle was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. The smaller car's windshield was smashed, the shattered glass on the ground, the driver's door ripped away by the impact, inside the driver's shoe and some of his remains. This fuel truck was heading down along the Bugandi Road at high speed when it crashed into the smaller Hyundai. Still shaken by the accident, the driver of a single cab, Walter Gebis, said the large truck should have given way to the, the Jawani Street came to a standstill as bystanders gathered to see the crash. A third vehicle was also hit by one of the vehicles that veered off the road. I'm just pushing me go down the road. Yeah. Police at the scene said the driver of the Hino truck had been traveling in from the highlands and was supposedly drunk. He fled the scene but was captured by police soon after. The driver of the smaller Hyundai was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lake. Mosby Northwest candidate Lohia Bo Samuel is expected to serve an election petition on winning member Sir Mekera Marauta. Mr. Samuel obtained the petition on the 5th of September and has tried without success to serve the petition on Sir Mekere. Samuel came second in the 2017 national elections. Today is also the final day of the 14-day notice by the courts for election petitions to be served. 
The election petition is in relation to election discrepancies during the polling and counting period in the Mosby Northwest electorate. It is believed to be the first election petition for Mosby Northwest, and the 58th election petition filed at the Court of Disputed Returns for the 2017 national elections. There were a lot, lot of uh, discrepancies. There were a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of discrepancies which are detailed in this uh, election petition number 58. Mr. Samuel was at the Royal Papua Yacht Club for other purposes when he cited Sam McCarran Morata walking towards his yacht. He called the police in for assistance to serve the petition. However, he claimed that Sam McCarran went into hiding. Out of courtesy, we, we called uh, a uh, Konedobu uh, police officers and three senior officers came and we, we, we gave them the petition to go and uh, get, uh, give it to Sam McCarran so he could... Uh, sign it as, as received. So wh whilst they went down there, uh, the, the boat, but his name is Paul, I think his name is Paul, he came out and he actually lied to the uh, uh, police officers saying that, oh, sorry, Sir McCary is not there, but only uh, uh, Lady Roslyn Morota. Since half past three this afternoon, Mr. Samuel has been waiting outside the Yacht Club to serve the petition, as this is the last day for him to serve the petition. Sir McCary is yet to make a response to this. Merlin Diaukatam, National MTV News. Newcrest has announced the first, the appointment of the first Papua New Guinean to oversee operations at its Lihir mine in New Island Province. Iso Eladona, a career mining engineer with more than 20 years experience both locally and abroad, has been appointed mine manager for Lihir. Eladona started his career as a mining engineer with Plesa New Guinea at its Misima mine before moving to Lihir Gold with the Lihir Management Company under the Rio Tinto Group in 1996. He was appointed as the first and youngest Papua New Guinean operations superintendent during the early years of Lihir. According to Newcrest's Mining Executive General Manager, Lihir and Kadia, Craig Judson, Newcrest is confident that Lihir will continue to deliver outstanding results under Eladona's leadership given his vast experience. Eladona's experience includes senior planning and leadership roles with Octedi Mining, Morabe Mining Joint Venture and Misima Mines. And now a look at the finance news. The Kino closed unchanged at 0.3125 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kino was buying 0.305 US dollars, 0.379 Australian dollars, 0.2514 Euro and 33.64 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower, coffee and cocoa close lower and copper close the day higher. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil and copper closed higher. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed 63 points higher, the ASX closed 3 points lower, and the All Ordinaries closed 3 points lower. Here with National LMTV News, among stories after the break, news making headlines overseas. Stay tuned. Welcome back to National MTV News. Turning overseas now, another powerful hurricane will hit the Caribbean in the coming hours and is expected to pass through some of the same islands that were devastated by Hurricane Irma last week. Maria has developed into a Category 5 hurricane. Tonight, Hurricane Maria rapidly intensifying. Residents bracing across the Caribbean. Puerto Rico boarding up. The second major hurricane bearing down on the island in less than two weeks. Flights to San Juan usually packed with tourists. Today, mostly residents scrambling to get back home. Maria now poised to make a direct hit. Do people are nervous, scared? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, it's been a while since we got such a strong hurricane uh, uh, hit us directly, so yeah. The eye of the deadly Category 5 Hurricane Irma passing just north of here. Winds on the island reaching 70 miles per hour. Irma devastating the Virgin Islands and the island of St. Martin destroying some 90% of the buildings on the island of Barbuda. We cannot afford to be complacent, so we need to pull out all the stops and prepare for an impact, just in case. Those islands already decimated, racing to clear debris left behind by Irma. All of the debris that's piled up uh, behind me, we're worried about that becoming projectiles. Residents asked to use rocks or anything heavy to weigh down debris. U.S. President Donald Trump has used his first speech at the United Nations to call for bold reforms, saying bureaucracy is stopping the organization from reaching its full potential. 
Mr. Trump said America is committed to making the United Nations work more effectively. As a New York property tycoon, Donald Trump looked on the United Nations as a real estate opportunity. He built a tower right opposite and wanted the contract to carry out refurbishments on its headquarters. As president, many thought he'd hurl a wrecking ball at the global body, a club he called it for people to get together, talk and have a good time. But today, Donald Trump walked through its doors as its most important member and came not to talk demolition, but reform. He said he wanted to make the United Nations great. In recent years, the United Nations has not reached its full potential because of bureaucracy and mismanagement. We encourage the Secretary General to fully use his authority to cut through the bureaucracy, reform outdated systems, and make firm decisions to advance the UN's core mission. In the new UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, President Trump has found an improbable ally in pushing through reform. The former Socialist Prime Minister Mr. of President, Portugal spoke the same language as the billionaire president. Our shared objective is a 21st century UN focused more on people, less on process. The US is by far the biggest funder of UN peacekeeping missions, such as this one in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Trump administration has slashed the budget by half a billion dollars. But the truth is, the UN had feared more savage cuts. It's a real honor, I have to say. We're going to Donald Trump has already engaged in the kind of diplomatic speed dating that's a feature of this week. But tomorrow he'll be alone, centre stage, for his first address to the UN General Assembly, a speech in which officials say... He'll hug the right people and he'll slap the right people. It was once said that toads imported from Hawaii would wipe out cane beetles and save Queensland's sugarcane industry. Now there are plans to set a snail loose on the Great Barrier Reef to save it from a killer starfish. Well, it sounds like something from a nightmare. Giant snails being bred to eat starfish. But excited researchers here in Queensland are hopeful it could be the answer to saving the reef from crown of thorns. The giant triton sea snail not only eats the starfish, it excretes a certain smell, causing them to flee. And so how could we use this? Well, one possible way is that we could put the odour into the water. They're both native species to the reef and once upon a time would have kept each other's populations in balance. The snail was almost hunted to extinction for its shell. It became protected in the 1960s but is still very rare. The federal government is now putting forward just over half a million dollars for a research and breeding program. 100,000 of the baby snails have already hatched. We do know that the triton also eats other uh, starfish and sea cucumbers, but what we don't know is what is their real preference. At the end of the two-year trial, researchers will look at releasing them into the reef, but this will be done in small test zones to avoid a cane toad type situation in the ocean. We don't want another situation where we, uh, we take out one threat and replace it with another. A big breakthrough nonetheless to protect a natural wonder that's worth around $60 billion to our national economy. You're with National MTV News. Coming up next, True Guy Sports, we'll have some sporting updates for you. Stay tuned. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. The Oil Search Trophy Tour made its way to Tari after their stop in Hanganofi, Eastern Highlands Province. It was welcomed by a huge crowd of rugby fanatics and singing groups at the airport. Thousands of people gathered in Tarrytown to welcome the Paul Barrier Trophy. The trophy was accompanied by Oil Search Managing Director Peter Borton, 2017 Rugby League World Cup CEO Andrew Hill, PNG RFL CEO Rata Rao, former NRL star Lori Tukiri, and senior Oil Search executives. <laughs> Representatives of Tari Rugby League and the Hela Provincial Government were also on hand to welcome the trophy. 
Speaking to thousands of rugby league enthusiasts in Hela yesterday, Oil Search Managing Director Peter Bolton said Oil Search was pleased to be sponsoring the Rugby League World Cup Trophy Tour. And the World Cup Trophy is a, is a symbol of excellence in, in a rugby league. And it's a real privilege to bring that here so that you can see it, you can get your photos with it, and you can touch it. Because the passion of rugby league in Papua New Guinea is putting through Channel 7, through NTV, putting Hella, you and the people of Hella on the world stage. They are seeing your passion for the game and your passion for PNG Cromos. Both Rao and Hill commended Oil Search for the initiatives in bringing the trophy tour around PNG. Can I thank you finally for coming out and supporting today. I will be reporting to all over the world the passion and the pride that you have in our great game. I hope that you... I hope that you're able to share in the excitement of having a global sporting event come to your team. We are now here, Makim Marshall, Chairman, Sunny Second, Abort Mongen. The rugby league uh, teams around the country, all the leagues, you go pick in, you go man, people man, people marry. Look, thank you, World Search. When Kissing is the World Cup trophy, he come long place for Emilio here. Look, all the other people in the country. Just want to reiterate that uh, you know these guys all sorts really support not only you guys in the community but uh, rugby league in, in this country. So get out and support the, the Kumuls at the end of October and November in the World Cup, and also your locals who are playing in uh, in November as well in Sydney. So for me, another another region. It's great to see the love that you guys have for rugby league. Thank you for having me here today. Following the speeches, a short nine-a-side rugby league game was played between the Hela Wigman team and a selected side, which also featured Tukiri. The trophy was then taken to Dowley Teachers College, Tari Secondary School and the Hela Provincial Hospital. The trophy was in Kutubu today. Elijah Lavet, National MTV Sports. To women's Rugby League, the first oil search PNG Orchids team was named today to take on the Australian Gillaroos. This will be the Orchids inaugural sanctioned test match to be played this weekend at the National Football Stadium. History was made today when the PNG RFL and Oil Search named the first ever PNG Orchids team. A 20-member team was named to take on the Gillaroos before the PM's 13 match on Saturday. PNG RFL chairman Sandy Saka says this is another milestone for women's rugby league in the country. To get the event here has been a long process. Uh, with the PM setting, we've been trying, with the growth of the women's game, the PNG RFL's investment over the last four years, we've been trying to get this match happening for some time. Naming right sponsors, Oil Search were thanked for their continuous support for rugby league in PNG, having sponsored the Orchids jerseys and the team uniform. Again, acknowledging the support of uh, Peter Borden and the Oil Search team to coming on board to support the uh, Oil Search PNG Orchids, the inaugural team, and we hope that it's a partnership and a relationship that we can continue to grow, which is mutually beneficial for both our brands, Rugby League and Oil Search. Oil Search Managing Director Peter Borden says it was through hard work from the PNG RFL that have gotten them this far. After the Games and the World Cup, we have to further develop the game and we look forward to working with the PNG Rugby League to further build the opportunities, not just for the men's team, but also for the women. The team consists of players selected from the National Confederate Championships held earlier this year. Though it may be tough playing the Gillaroos, Orchids coach Dennis Miles says the team will do what it takes. We found that there are women out there who had guts and guts that they can stand together as one stand tall on the field, hold their heads up high, and do the country proud. And I believe these women that have been assembled have the guts to play. They have the strength. They will share the sacrifice. They will share the confidence. And they will give the best shot for the World Cup and do Papua New Guinea proud this coming weekend. Kathy Neap was nominated the first ever Orchids captain to lead the team this weekend. 
I'd like to say thank you to PNG RFL, first of all, for being very supportive of PNG Women's Rugby League. And they have, the men behind the scene have pushed the game forward and helped, uh, helped stood up for us women. I know that when Rugby League first started, like, they used to make fun of us, but through the men behind the scene, PNG RFL, they've been able to support us and push the Women's Rugby League forward. The Orchids will play their first ever sanctioned test match on Saturday at the National Football Stadium. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Papua New Guinea is among 63 other nations participating in the Asian Indoor and Martial Arts Games in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan. Sunday night's opening ceremony marked yet another chapter for PNG as its flag was proudly on display in the Central Asian Republic. MTV's Jeremy Mogi and cameraman Albert Naime are in that part of the world. It began as this quiet murmuring, 45,000 people crammed into Ashgabat's Olympic Stadium, which is easily double the size of PNG's beloved Sir John Geis. And what would start off as quiet murmuring would soon transcend into this enthralling mix of Arabic culture infused with the lights of modern technology and, of course, traditional Turkmen delights. Land and sea would combine as the history of Turkmenistan unfolded throughout the evening. The five regions of this land, once under the Soviet Empire, all demonstrated with the Zodiac as their guide. Their science revealed a revelation indeed coming from a culture that knows itself to be fairly modern. This was more than a welcoming of athletes and international guests, but a deep lesson in the endurance of culture and its ever-grown importance in a world seemingly desperate to let its past go. Exit the camels and white-clad dancers. Enter the green of the Turkmen flag. Papua New Guinea would be one of the last countries to enter the stadium, but when it did, it arrived to a raucous of support. <music> Turkmenistan is a country of very few international guests, and last night's event showcased what the country does have to offer to the international world. Jeremy Mogi, MTV Sports, Turkmenistan. Stay tuned. True Guy Sports continues after these messages. Don't go away. True Guy Sports. Welcome back to True Guy Sports. Basketball PNG CEO and coach of the men's national team, Joel Kalu, says it's crunch time for PNG as host nation of the 2017 FIBA Melanesian Cup. PNG, along with Fiji, New Caledonia, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, will compete over four days for the Melanesian title. The matches to be televised live on MTV. The men's national coach says a lot of work still needs to be done from a logistics standpoint, but the federation is excited to host the event. Carlo believes PNG has the best men's team to take on our Melanesian brothers. You know, when, like you said, when there's only 12, 12 spots available, it, uh, it, it gets pretty intense. So, yeah, look, we believe that we've got one of the best PNG basketball men's sides that probably has ever come together. And, you know, hopefully we can show that in the, in the Melanesian Cup when we hit the floor. Kalu also praised the national women's coach, Moi Muri, who is leading a fairly young team. Uh, you know, his, his playing pedigree speaks for itself with, you know, his participation at such a high level in, in, in two Pacific games. Uh, his coaching, uh, I guess, background from grassroots community all the way through to, you know, national team stuff, both men's and women's. Um, so it's been good. It's been good experience for me, you know, watching him in, in terms of some of the stuff that, uh, you know, he's been able to, I guess, uh, mould and shape with his women's side. Meanwhile, the FIBA Melanesian Cup is on a promotional tour around the city to ramp up support ahead of the Games. Took our two trophies around and did have a bit of a tour around Port Moresby. Um, it was fantastic, the reception that, you know, not only the players got, but 
especially young kids having the opportunity to, to get the trophies in hand and take photos and selfies and, and all that. It's a, it's a great part of our, I guess, our marketing and promotion for the event. Um, as I said, 10 days out, uh, we want to try and really ramp up, you know, promotions for it and make sure that we're getting a, a full house. The competition starts on Tuesday, 27 September. PNG will play Fiji on day one, followed by Solomon Islands and New Caledonia. Tickets for the tournament will be sold at the gate at the reasonable price. As far as I've kind of been informed, Fiji are bringing a, an absolute full strength side. Um, Solomon Islands um, have been probably, their preparation is probably going to be a lot better than what they've had in, in other tournaments. They've got uh, some new coaches that are based over there, uh, Australian coaches I believe. New Caledonia is always a tricky one because they have so many players that play in the French professional leagues that their, their seasons are, are kind of underway. So it'll be interesting to see what players they bring. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. The world record for cycling around the world has been broken. A British endurance cyclist has set a new record for the fastest circumnavigation of the globe. The Scotsman smashed the previous record of 123 days by completing the voyage in 78 days. Every road has its challenges, only one has the reward. Since he last saw Paris, Mark Beaumont has cycled 18,000 miles in less than 80 days. In that time, his youngest daughter has begun to talk and run. His four-year-old reserved the first hug. From Paris, Mark headed east through Russia, Mongolia and China crossing Australia and New Zealand before flying to Alaska, where he cycled down through North America, before landing back in Europe for the final stretch from Lisbon to Paris. Cycling from 4 a.m. until 9 at night, he saw the sun rise and set over the Australian desert, the vast Russian landscape, averaging 240 miles a day, the equivalent of cycling from London to Blackpool every day since the 2nd of July. He almost didn't make it past day nine when a crash left him with an elbow injury and a broken tooth which demanded emergency dentistry from his physiotherapist. This is the end of an epic journey. Mark Beaumont has not only smashed his own previous round the world timing but he's also cut the current world record by a third. At the finish line, he was greeted by an official from the Guinness Book of Records. His time, 78 days and a little over 13 hours. And that wraps up Trukai Sports. We'll have for you the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours and when we begin in the southern region. Port Mosby, Daru and Kerma, fine and becoming partly cloudy with light rain drizzle expected. Alutau and Popendeta, cloudy with a few light rain and showers. To the Mombasa region, a few showers expected in Leh and wow, fine becoming cloudy for Medang, Webeck and Vanimo with a top of 31 degrees. To the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine for Lorangao, fine becoming cloudy for Kaviang. Thundery showers expected in Kokopo, Robaul, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, uh, some showers expected in Mount Hagen, Goruka, Kundia, Mendi and Wabeg are fine becoming cloudy over the next 24 hours. To a look at the shipping forecast, but first there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait to Daru to Kiwai Island to Yule Island to Hood Point to all Milne Bay Islands including Samarai Island, Cape Vogel, Finchafin through VTS Strait, Dampier Strait and CC Island to Long Island to West New Britain and South Bougainville. Waters of Southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Yule Island to Hood Point, Samurai Island and with waters of Finchafen through Vitya Strait, Dampier Strait including CRC Island to Long Island 
She is 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Kerama and with the waters of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Awiwak, Aetape, Vanimo and the northern PNG Indonesian border, C0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Samurai to Cape Vogel and to Finchafen, C1 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, C0.8 to 1.6 meters. Waters of West New Britain to Bougainville, C2 to 3 meters. And waters of East New Britain to New Island, C0.5 to 2 meters. And a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas for tonight and tomorrow. Coral Sea, seas rough to patches very rough with southeasterly winds at 25 to 34 knots, reaching 48 knots at some times. Solomon Sea, seas moderate to rough with southeasterly winds at 15 to 34 knots. Bismarck Sea, seas moderate to rough patches with southeasterly winds at 15 to 34 knots. And the Pacific Ocean, seas light to moderate with southeasterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. And that's the way it is this Tuesday, the 19th of September. From the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.